good morning everybody uh, i'll be speaking something about uh, how we analyze gut microbiota and uh, the topic i have chosen is essentially because there is a new found interest in analyzing gut microbiota in liver diseases and at our hospital also many studies are being undertaken and what i've realized is that uh, in uh, multiple of these studies the analysis lacks some kind of an understanding on how to approach the problem how to collect the samples and how to uh, statistically process it and what are the features that need to be recorded and uh, analyzed to fruitfully interpret what the gut microbiota composition actually uh, tells us about or relates to the disease so uh, for those uh, who are new to this field uh, particularly uh, nursing students and new uh, uh, dm and phd students uh, microbiota is uh, essentially all the bacteria fungi viruses and other uh, microorganisms that uh, inhabit our body both externally as well as internally and they are affected by um, all the features uh, that we interact with in our daily life including drugs diet exercise uh, as well as uh, they process the metabolites and compounds produced in the body itself the diet with, that we consume because the gut itself has a huge amount of uh, bacterial and fungal load and these are then uh, sent out in circulation and then they affect the or interact with the uh, other body organs including uh, an alteration in uh, this uh, microbial composition leads to diseases uh, which are uh, at a different site for example uh, microbial alteration in the gut itself has been proven to uh, induce uh, liver related diseases heart related diseases even now parkinsons have been correlated very strongly with uh, alterations in the gut microbiota so essentially uh, what we do is to understand uh, the pathophysiology or the functioning of the microbiota in both healthy as well as diseased we take and uh, we take a multi omic approach when i say omics what i mean is a high throughput analysis and uh, not a simple presence absence of course presence absence becomes a part of that analysis itself and we are we try to capture uh, the genome uh, which is uh, the total number of genes present in the microbiota the transcriptome which is the genes that are expressed which vary depending upon the healthy or the disease condition the meta genome which is uh, the total genome of all the bacteria and all the fungi that is present at a given site the proteome the total number of proteins and the metabolome the metabolites that are produced uh, in the various physiological processes now a very uh, simple fact uh, that is very well established is that the microbiota it changes particularly now we are talking about gut microbiome it changes with the age and this is in uh, healthy conditions so uh, if we uh, look at the big broader classifications i'll come to this later of uh, the bacteria called formicutes bacteroidetes actinobacteria or proteobacteria then their proportions as shown in these donut plots varies from let's say when uh, in an unborn child in breastfed or in a, a baby this uh, particular group of actinobacteria is absolutely vanishing uh, within a span of about 3 to 4 months and this is affected by antibiotics malnutrition or uh, the kind of diet and the lifestyle that we are having when we are adult and again it changes during the uh, elderly stages now why this is important is that this particular group of adults is very interesting because we generally when we are investigating uh, or comparing diseases with healthy or the progression of the disease before and after treatment a uh, general practice has been to take any age uh, any individual within the age group of 18 to 60 years or sometimes even it goes to 70 but then 18 to 16 the microbiota has uh, been shown to have variations and now that we know that microbiota is an in integral uh, we can call it an organ although it changes its structure and composition we can very uh, safely conclude that 
the microbiota composition should be considered in uh, various analysis that we do because it is interacting with the outcome of the disease or of the treatment. Many of the drugs are being processed by the bacteria and we are not considering it and we are simply taking the effect of the drug. If we can alter the bacteria and make the drug more efficacious, it automatically becomes, the same strategy becomes fruitful. Now, since we are talking about the gut, so how is the bacteria distributed in the gut? I'll be speaking mostly about the bacteria. We are not uh, going into the fungi or the virome part uh, because this uh, component is, uh, uh, is the largest that is present in the gut and has been studied uh, to a great extent. So if in this figure, uh, if, if we look at the post-gastric uh, part of the gut, uh, I have listed here uh, the dominant uh, gut phyla. Again, I'll come to what phyla is. The families that are present in the small intestine and the colon and in the various regions of the gut itself. And the, what I want to bring your attention to is the figure on the bottom left where the bacterial load has been shown to change from, uh, let's say, 100 colony forming units per gram of sample to about 10 to power 11 or 10 to power 12 colony forming units per gram of sample. Now, what is interesting here is that this is a change in, you know, multiples of logs. It is almost like an 8 log, 10 log change. But what is interesting is these are CFUs, these are colony forming units which have been uh, isolated from the samples in the gut and have been cultured. Almost 50%, 40 to 50% of the bacteria in the gut are unculturable. We, because they are anaerobic, they are obligate anaerobes, or their conditions are not met. So this number is very different. And people have gone on to even propose that we have three times the bacteria than we have human cells in the body. So even if it is one to one, which is uh, which is now known uh, so far, uh, we are half bacteria and half human cells. So are we human or are we bacteria is a matter of debate, and it will be proven later. Now that bacteria are controlling the brain, the same cases of Parkinson's and all. Also, as we know that uh, the pH changes in the gut, and the color of the color that is shown in on the bottom left uh, panel uh, here is matched with the kind of phyla and the families that respond to such conditions. So for example, bacteroidetes uh, and actinobacteria are responding to oxygen. So if the oxygen con concentration varies, the, the, the proportion of these bacteria vary. And this happens uh, as well for pH. So, uh, although I, I'll, uh, we take this example of bacteroidetes and firmicutes, and again, I'll be coming back to a very important slide, uh, why I took this. The firmicutes are responding to the pH, while the bacteroidetes are responding to uh, the oxygen concentration. And this oxygen concentration, if we see, actually varies from uh, the lumen in the gut to the crypts uh, below, uh, underneath the villi. So, and this is a very, very steep gradient, and the amount of time it takes for the food to pass, the amount of time it takes for the drug to pass, the amount of time it takes for the drug to go from the lumen to the crypt all defines the bacterial composition or the composition of these bacteria and how they behave. Not only that, we have immunoglobulins and other antibacterial peptides present in uh, the upper half of uh, the gut primarily as an evolutionary strategy. Because the animal, let's say animal, we can consider ourselves also, we are eating something, we do not know what is going in. Now we are, we consider ourselves sophisticated. In prehistoric times, it was not clear. So the gut has evolved in such a way that the antibacterials are present in the upper half of the gut, while they are almost lost in the lower half or in the colonic region. So coming to uh, some basic definitions that uh, you will be coming across whenever you will be reading some articles about microbiota. Uh, there are two uh, very important uh, uh, words that you will come across and these have, diff these have been used interchangeably but have different meaning. One is microbiome and the other is metagenome. So microbiome is basically the ecological community, the whole set of all the bacteria, all the different types of bacteria present uh, as commensal, symbiotic, or pathogens, 
that literally share our body space or for that matter in broader ecological terms which occupy a particular habitat that habitat can be our body or we want to be specific it can be the gut itself or it can be just the palm of our hand it depends on what we are defining the habitat as the other is meta genome now meta analysis everybody is familiar of, familiar with so genome is nothing but the whole set of genes that are present in an organism that's a genome now when we are looking at bacteria we know that there is not one bacteria that is present we are, we as as i've shown you earlier there are multiple bacteria present in the gut each has its own unique genome which makes it distinct from the other so that taken together becomes a meta so taken together all the genomes of all the bacteria that are present it becomes a meta genome now uh, nih human uh, genetic center uh, defines metagenomics as the study of structure and function of the entire nucleotide sequences isolated and analyzed from all the organisms typically microbe in bulk samples uh, it can be a smaller sample also but essentially the idea is that the to all the bacteria being analyzed together at the same times is called as metagenome and should be separated from microbiome now other two terms that you will come across very uh, commonly is u biases and dis biases now this is uh, something which is uh, very similar to uh, what is a healthy and a unhealthy since there is no clear definition of what a healthy is and only unhealthy can be identified with the presence of disease u biases and uh, dis biases is also uh, being defined on pretty much the same scale with u biases being the state of microbiota associated with the healthy status of the host now this is okay i'll i'll take this in a second and dis biases is the absence of normal colonization and is associated with disease now when i say u biases associated with the healthy state of uh, the host in in a in a couple of studies that we are undertaking currently almost uh, 30% of healthy individuals which were screened had some or the other kind of disease and they were thoroughly screened for any kind of uh, hepatic or uh, intestinal disorders or any other uh, kidney related disorder or any disorder for that matter so let's consider uh, Uh, what we had in one study was approximately 120 individuals and in another one we had uh, screened about uh, 60 individuals and in both the cases 30% of the individuals were rejected uh, from inclusion uh, because they had some disorder of some sort without presenting any clear symptoms for any disease so what we come to uh, learn from this is that what Uh, we consider as healthy should be defined as apparently healthy unless screened for thoroughly for the diseases and same is the case with the bacteria in this apparently healthy individual we need to screen it first for the healthy condition then consider the bacteria and then correlate it with the healthy condition and identify what the healthy condition is now as i said in the first slide the bacteria respond to what we eat how we behave uh, with or in, interact with our environment what is our daily routine and all that so the bacteria itself changes between the healthy individuals a vegetarian type of bacteria is different from a non vegetarian eating type of bacteria not very different but yes there are distinct uh, bacteria which are uh, found in both the cases so we have to now uh, consider this u biases as a very very broad term where we are only considering bacteria which are related to a non diseased individual rather than a healthy individual and dis biases is when the bacteria is considered is attached or is identified in a diseased individual on the other hand what happens if the bacteria itself is changing and causing the disease so in a in a study in 2017 uh, a detailed analysis of almost 554 uh, papers was considered where dis biases and uh, u biases was used and what they classified uh, or identified is that there are basically four uh, three broad categories one is imbalance the other is the change and third is the specific bacteria with change so what is imbalance imbalance is when the bacteria is present in a certain proportion in a non diseased individual but those proportions change and this is called dis biases this is one part what is specific the 
proportion of the bacteria is pretty much the same in non-diseased individual except for one particular bacteria which increases in number. Most of the times uh, we uh, say that uh, there is an E. coli infection. Uh, yes, so one bacteria has changed. Uh, an attached caveat with E. coli is that uh, E. coli is present as 0.1% in the gut. And when you culture uh, the samples of the gut, E. coli is the first one to adapt to these cultures and grow prolif very prolifically. So that does not mean that E. coli is actually the mo most, uh, most dominant uh, species in the gut. And this has been called as the great plate anomaly. So whatever comes on the culture is actually not the true representation of the gut. And more so you must have seen in the cases of uh, sepsis, uh, where the patients have sepsis, the cultures are negative. So does that mean that there is no bacteria? Possibly, that no bacteria is involved, possibly, because it could be a virus also, or it could be a bacteria, as I said earlier, which is non-culturable and has increased in number. So what do you do? You have to take different strategies, which I'll come to. And then there is the change, which change is like when an external uh, factor is involved in the uh, bacteria, like eating some uh, contaminated uh, food or water, which is introducing a new bacteria to the gut, which is bringing the change in the gut population. So uh, in, in case of analysis of uh, uh, the gut bacteria, uh, the numbers actually are important because bacteria are very small and as I told earlier the number of bacteria and the number of human cells is pretty much the same in the organism called human. So how do we understand this? So this is something which is very basic and uh, is taught to uh, people in uh, undergraduate classes. Now uh, one term that is very commonly used and confused with is called taxa. Now, what is a taxa? Taxa is nothing but a common name given to the various levels of uh, hierarchical classification. Now, what is, what is this hierarchical classification? So, when we look at, uh, I mean, humans are very fond of classifications, like uh, even in the university you have assistant professors, associate professors and so on, and in-house you have garam masala and not so garam masala and, you know, uh, different classifications we have. So we are fond of rich people, poor people, um, you know, healthy people, diseased people. So we have all these kind of classifications. We tend to have it, good boy, bad boy, whatever. So to understand the details of nature, this is a very normal strategy. And this is also uh, being adopted in both animal classification, plant classification, as well as in bacterial classification. So the, the broader, uh, cl the broadest domain uh, or the broadest classification that we uh, name is called domain. Now here we have bacteria, archaea and eukarya. We know bacteria, uh, eukarya is where everything else including fungi and uh, animals and plants and everything else is included. Archaea is essentially like bacteria but they do not have the exact features like bacteria and definitely are not multicellular organisms, so they are not put in eukarya. So this is the broadest domain. Then we have, I take this example of, uh, let's say, humans, and then we have what is called as kingdom. So in kingdom, we have animals and plants, so animalia and planti, for example. Now in animals, we can have uh, crustaceans, birds, uh, mammals, or reptiles, right? Then we further classify whether they are chordate or non-chordate, having a vertebra or not, not having vertebra, so immediately these crustaceans are removed from this classification. Further down we can still classify them into what is called as, which, are, which of these are mammals. So birds and reptiles are removed from this group. Then we have within mammals, which are the primate, primates. Primates are uh, the big or the apes uh, fraction. So this, this includes chimpanzees, humans, babonos and other monkeys. Then among these primates we have what is uh, called as the family homonidae. So family homonidae is what we are proud of as being humans, chimpanzees and bonobos. Bonobos is a South African uh, ape, which is uh, the closest relative to humans, sharing almost 99.8% of our uh, genome. Then we come to a classification level called as genus. Genus, we are homos in which humans and bonobos, both are homo. We are homo sapiens, they are, uh, I'm forgetting, they are homo bonobos or something. And uh, then we have species which is the sapiens. 
So to know us, we have to know the nature and differentiate ourselves. Now this is again, as I mentioned, this is based on characteristics that each level of classification carries. The same thing applies to bacteria. And the level of classification is based on both the structure as well as the function. And when I say function, I include here uh, the molecules that are pr produced, the specific uh, response that these bacteria have to different, different uh, environmental conditions. Some may be growing in hot sulfur springs, some may be growing in, in Arctic water, some are in high pH, some are in low pH. So all these factors are included when we are classifying the bacteria. And again, as uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, we have the same phylum class, order, family, genus, species uh, distribution for the bacteria itself. And if you, uh, this is a pretty complex looking graph, but uh, simple to understand. If you look at the phylum, there are few, uh, few phyla. Phyla is singular, phylum is, uh, phylum is, uh, yeah. Phylum is singular, phyla is plural. So, we have few uh, phyla and this number increases as we move towards the species which means that the differences become finer and finer the broader differences are in the phyla level the finer differences are at the species level now with this uh, classification strategy what has been identified is that two phyla the firmicutes and the bacteroidetes which i mentioned earlier also contributes to 90% of the gut bacterial count, which means at the broadest level of grouping, 90% of the bacteria is contributed by these two phyla. So if I say that in dysbiosis, where the bacteria is changing because of certain disease or something, there is a change in the phyla level, it means that everything under that is changing very dramatically in comparison to the control uh, sample or whatever that is. Now, interestingly, in this 90%, Fermicutes have almost like 200 different genera. So 200 dif different genera, which is a pretty low level uh, classification at the genus level, is contributing to 90% of the gut bacterial population, of which Clostridium constitutes 95%. So, should we focus on Clostridium? Yes, we can focus on Clostridium, but Clostridia, as you know, uh, as gastroenterologist, it has a variety of uh, species and strains, some being beneficial and some being pathogenic. Interestingly, these strains and species are present together at the same time in the gut. E. coli is present in the gut, Streptococcus is present in the gut, Pseudomonas is present in the gut. Again, depending on what pH and what oxygen concentrations uh, they are adapted to. But they are controlled by the healthier or the more dominant uh, species so that they don't take over and become pathogenic. Again, a very interesting correlation with what is eubiasis and what is dysbiosis. Presence of bad bacteria does not mean dysbiosis. It is naturally present in a healthy individual also. So uh, with all this details and all this uh, you know nitty gritty and uh, so many su such a fine tuning how do we analyze uh, so such a large number of uh, bacteria in a sample so uh, there are some uh, definitions or some words that you will be coming across all the uh, papers that you read about gut bacteria uh, one is community which is nothing but a group on association of populations of two or more different species occupying the same area now it is not in as i have shown in gut bacteria it is not just two there are multiple so it's multiple species that are occupying a certain area now when i say a certain area or a certain site then here we are defining very clearly what kind of environment it is living in it is buccal cavity it is colon what is the ph what is the level of hydration whether drug is given or not given then count is simple it's a count one two three four richness is the count of the species at species level and abundance is the number of individuals or species found per sample so i take 10 individuals with the diarrhea and if i want to compare it with non-diarrhea controls uh, then 
I am looking at what is the abundance of, let's say it, it's caused by E. coli, what is the abundance of E. coli in each sample separately and that becomes the abundance in each sample. When I just take a proportion of that, multiply, take it out of 100, it becomes a relative abundance and the more important is the alpha diversity, evenness and rarity which encompasses most of the information that we have about the bacterial population or the microbial population. And I am talking about bacteria here, but this can be used for fungi, this can be used for viruses, this can be used for anything which has been classified well. It, it's just a matter of what level of classification we want to capture the details at. The mathematical relationships became, remain the same. So if, if, if we consider the Shannon index, which is the alpha diversity or the diversity within a sample, so as I said earlier, there are 10 samples from diarrhea, alpha diversity would be alpha diversity of each of these 10 samples. When we represent it for publication, we say, yes, okay, this is the total average alpha diversity that we have. So one has to be clear in this that there's a difference in alpha diversity, average alpha diversity and alpha diversity of a sample. And uh, do, do not get lost in the, uh, the equations. It is nothing but summation of the proportions and the log values of that. And when we take a log of some value, it automatically comes to between zero and one and uh, or becomes negative. And to counter that, uh, the statisticians have put a negative sign uh, to make it a positive value. As the other is evenness, which means that if there are uh, uh, 10 species in the gut of uh, a diarrheal, uh, in, in 10 diarrheal or in a, in a diarrhea patient and 10 in the healthy patient, then are these 10 represented by the same number of individuals or there is a difference. In diarrhea patient E. coli increases, so there is a difference. The rest of the numbers remain the same except that one species increases very dramatically, right? So that tells about the evenness of the community. So the response that we are getting from the bacteria is most of the time a group effect. It is not one bacteria. It never would be one bacteria unless it is a disease condition. The other important aspect is the rarity, which means those species which are not present in abundance. But as has been seen in larger ecological communities like forests and uh, uh, your coral reefs and all that, the species which are less in number are producing some metabolites or are producing some molecular signals which are defining how the rest of the community is behaving. They are taking lead from these rare species. Thus, rarity itself becomes important. Rarity becomes important in case of dysbiosis. Why? Because if there are 10 individuals of 10 different species present together, suddenly two species go down to level of one or two individuals, which means that there is a dysbiosis in the balance of, as, as we saw earlier in the imbalance, there is an imbalance in the gut microbial community. And this can be then related to whatever the feature we are trying to capture in the analysis. So to explain this very quickly, uh, if we have uh, three uh, samples here, and each color represents uh, one bacterial species and each uh, ellipse represents a count. Now, if I want to estimate what is the richness, the count of species, the evenness, how close in numbers each species is in a sample, and let's say what is the abundance of green species. Well, so let's say this is an E. coli. So what is the abundance of E. coli in different samples? So there are three of each type in this, but there are four colors. There are five colors, but the numbers are different. And here again, there are four colors, but the numbers are same. So numbers here are same, four colors are, are less. Numbers are same, four colors. This should be identical at this. Yes, it is, but only at the richness level. Sorry, uh, only at the evenness level. Here, because of introduction of one new bacteria and reduction in one bacteria, the evenness is different. And a, a simple logic you, you can remember is that evenness always varies from zero to one, which is nothing but zero to 100%. How e similar the numbers are, 100% similar. How 
if they are absolutely dissimilar, it becomes close to zero. Now then we have abundance. Abundance again, if you see, varies because the numbers vary, and abundance is dependent on the numbers per sample. So this is, of course, all this can be done uh, in Excel sheets once we have that raw uh, Excel uh, data, and it's not a very difficult thing. It can be done very easily. Now we have softwares, I'll be coming to that. Then the, we talked about the alpha diversity, which is the diversity within the sample. Then we have what is called as beta diversity, which is diversity between two different sites. Right? Now you may say that, okay, we were comparing a healthy and a, a diseased person, why can't it be considered as beta diversity? Yes, it is considered as beta diversity. And in this case, uh, just because this graph was uh, interesting, I've taken the case of major depression disorder, not to be correlated with ILBS, compared with uh, healthy controls. And there are two different kinds of diversities, beta diversities. One is Bray Curtis index, another is Jacquard index. If we look at this, one index is dependent on the abundance of species and differentiates the two disease groups or the two groups under analysis in this particular A-shaped fashion. Whereas Jacquard index, which is presence and absence of species, almost like mixes it up in this circular fashion. So what is the importance of this? The importance is the question that you are asking. Why do you want to study the microbiota? You want to study the microbiota to understand the presence or absence. Well, we will not go for breaker test, we will go for Jacquard index. Now, if you want to cap capture what is, how the abundance is affecting the dif distribution between the two sites, we will not go for Jacquard index. Of course, presence absence is different between the two sites. But we will go for the breaker test. So, whenever you are reading a paper, just remember this what index is being used and then correlated back to whether this is indicating presence absence or this is indicating the abundance of taxa between comparing between the two sites. Another uh, kind of classification uh, system that has been uh, used is called enterotypes. Now enterotypes is based on uh, enterotypes is based on the presence or absence of this group of uh, phyla or these phyla or the presence or absence of these bacteria and there are this, it has been identified and classified into three groups first enterotype 1 enterotype 2 and enterotype 3 by just presence and absence of this a large uh, almost like uh, 1500 1600 individuals were analyzed across the continents european american japanese hawaiian uh, asian populations uh, and then it was identified that the whole po human population can be classified into these three kinds of enterotypes based on their diet and uh, habitat. But then slowly this has come into question and uh, we ourselves were confused when we analyzed the enterotypes in uh, our patients who were given uh, steroids. Some, and we were comparing responders and non-responders. So what we find is that after day seven of treatment in both the responders and non-responders, whereas at the baseline, the enterotypes were even in E2 types, but after treatment, irrespective of the treatment, they both turned into an E3 type of enterotype. Now, is this because of hospitalization, because both, both the groups were hospitalized? I don't know. But what we noticed is that there is a difference in the E3 type itself. There is a big difference. So when we say that enterotypes are, resp are responding to a particular environment or particular diet or particular type of uh, condition that they are in, why is there a difference in the enterotypes between responders and non-responders, which means that it is not a very robust classification system and should not be you know, really taken very seriously. So how do we uh, analyze all these bacteria which are like such a large number? And I will simply say make them shit. And why so? Because stool has been considered the best sample to capture the whole diversity in, e in similar proportions right from buccal to rectal region. Buccal cavity is considered to be having roughly around 10 to power 4 bacteria. 
and colonic region is considered to be having 10 to power 11 to 10 to power 12 bacteria. The same proportions are present in stool sample. You take 100 grams of stool, you take 10 grams of stool, the proportions remain the same. What we require is basically just about 2 grams of stool sample to capture the total diversity from buckle to, of, from buckle to the end in this. And what we are using to identify the bacteria definitely is not the culture because half of the bacteria are unculturable, but all these bacteria they have DNA. That is the best material. So we take the DNA from the stool and then we try to identify what are the different types of DNA because each DNA is specific to each bacteria because each bacteria is having certain phenotypes based on which the classification was made. The phyla, the order, the genus. Correct? And phenotype includes the metabolites and the molecules that are produced. So we isolate the bacterial DNA. Now there are two methods, two broad methods uh, of uh, uh, understanding the bacterial diversity. One is called the metagenomic analysis. Again, the whole genomes are analyzed. The total genome, whatever is present is analyzed. The other is 16S gene. 16S gene is a ribosomal gene involved in uh, translation of uh, from RNA to proteins. And therefore, this particular gene has been found to be specific to a particular type of uh, bacteria. Now, this gene is just just about 1540 bases. So very, very small gene. But within this, and the nine regions that it carries, within this, it has so much of information that it can differentiate bacteria from one type to another with the caveat that it is very good up to family level. When you want to identify families, no need to spend money on the whole metagenome kind of a thing. It is very good, you can finish it here but it is also good at genus level. So till genus level, there is no harm in using 16S. Species level definitely do not count on it. Yes, when we do 16S analysis, we do we capture uh, species, but these are so specific that you, you can capture those species, those particular species with the 16S gene. Now, as I said, there are two uh, methods that we uh, use. One is the amplicon, one is the metagenome. Amplicon is nothing but amplifying this particular gene and then analyzing using various softwares on what these groups are. Uh, the, the big difference between the two analyses is the cost that we have per sample. And I have included all the costs that are present here. Uh, uh, and then further, we the rest is taken care by the sequencing machines. Of course, these are uh, expensive uh, technologies, but then they are very accurate and are being uh, developed so much so that uh, recently a sequencer was sent in space and was found to perform successfully. Then what we get out of this is our two different kind of sets of data. One is called the OTUs, the other is called the assembly. And OTU is nothing but operational taxonomic unit because at this point we do not know which bacteria we are talking about. Everything is 16S. So we blindly say that, okay, let's let this be numbered, serially numbered from 1 to 200 or whatever bacteria that we have captured. And in the assembly, we have the whole genome data. That whole genome data actually uh, looks like this, that we have equal sized fragments which is spanning the whole reference uh, with the whole length of the reference sequence and we then add these up and then we form what is uh, what comes to become a consensus sequence and with this consensus sequence then we identify which bacteria it is because it has been worked out earlier and put in a reference database. So I, I'll not go into the, the technology here uh, although it is nothing great but uh, the amplified uh, DNA fragment is put on a glass plate which already has some nucleotide and it is made to bend over, PCR reaction is run, uh, one uh, strand is removed and on the other strand uh, the synthesis occurs and this is captured in the form of light signals because each uh, base, there are four bases, A, A T, G, C, M, I, adenine, guanine, cytosine and thymine and each are labeled with different colors. Now, if you can uh, see the this the bottom figure is changing color with each uh, base being added. So when PCR is happening on the reference DNA, the sample that we have added, 
the new bases are being added which are super complementary to each other and as it is added a signal is given i'm explaining it very simply there is a stop start reaction and everything happens in between so when one base is added a photograph is taken now that photograph tells me at because the dna is standing on glass plates that site is not changing so we know that okay at this particular point we have a t attached and the rest of the places are blank suddenly we see in the next photograph we take it becomes green and then yellow and then uh, blue and this cycle goes on and at each base addition there is a photograph taken so in sequencing the first data that we capture is a photograph it's actually an image this is done throughout the process up till it is finished after that this set of raw images which runs into few gbs of data is put onto a computer a very heavy computer and then there it takes these images and converts these images as they are uh, ordered because they are captured with time so as they are ordered it is then captured and converted into text and that is where we get the atgc and all this information from after we have all this information then we want to find out whether our analysis was even accurate or it was something we captured and we should have included more samples so for that we plot what is called as rarefaction curve if a if if a rarefaction curve is not present in a study consider it there is something fishy about it because rarefaction curve only tells that or a mention of that which tells that you have captured enough sample so that the 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 lines of this plot have saturated based on how many samples you have collected on the other hand on the figure on the right that we see it is kind of still growing it is not saturated and plateaued which means that there is still scope for more samples to be added so that all the information is captured and this is something very important very easily missed nobody mentions and everybody continues to work with this once we have all this sequence information and everything then it is a complete matter of the bioinformatician and the softwares that is used uh, in amplicon sequencing we have a whole set of softwares in metagenome also we have a whole set of softwares these packages uh, vary from each other depending again on the kind of question you are asking you just want to capture the the difference the t test or you really want to capture the single nucleotide variations in each bacteria or you want to capture the deletions or you want to capture the copy number of the genes that are present in the whole genome it again varies now here i have on the right side this image uh, i've just put for i was excited when i was doing this analysis of about 180 samples which we got from uh, sequencing and the machine that i'm using has 20 cpus or 20 cores all of them were running at 100% my ram was 64 gb normal laptops have about 4 to 8 gbs of ram this was 64 gb it was not only running at full capacity but also took about 10 gbs from the hard disk space and this is just 180 so now i am running 200 and uh, almost 90 samples and it is taking about 3 days to just process the first step uh, so it it becomes kind of a, a logarithmically time consuming as the number of samples increases so what we get after all this information is a list of bacteria in a plain flat excel sheet where we have the samples and the bacteria mentioned and we have their counts now these counts have to be refined now after this point everything becomes statistical it is simple statistics that is to be used but there are slight variations i'll come to that and we can come across figures like this very commonly which is nothing but a, a circular representation of this particular dendrogram which is clustering the groups of samples based on the distribution of the bacteria which is marked by different colored bars here and which means that at at the largest level there are two broad groups one is this one the other is this one why so from primarily because of this escherichia shigella which is being uh, uh, sorry prevotella this is prevotella so prevotella being present in this particular group of samples which is very very small here or absent in rest of the samples so this is not a very great shake signs very easy to understand 
the other aspect uh, that is uh, uh, that is coming up very rapidly is the metaproteome and metagenome analysis now in using the metaproteome oh, sorry metagenome metabolome analysis using the uh, the proteome or the proteins produced by the bacteria or present in the bacteria at any given time, we can now identify the bacteria even up to species level, but not 100%. Since all the bacteria have not been identified, classified, and this is just about a two years old technique, uh, the sample, uh, the, the result that we get out of this is, is not as uh, robust as the genomic data is. Again, Genomic data is also not very robust because if you run the same sample again because of machine related errors, you may get some slight variation of about 0.5% or 0.2% between that range. But then this technique is new, databases are not available, people are still working on it. So, but this is a very promising uh, and a much faster method because all you have to do is uh, capture this, take the sample, isolate the protein, digest it and run it through a mass spec and capture the peaks which can be very uh, readily con converted into the information uh, about the proteins that are present and those proteins can be mapped onto which bacteria present these proteins. The problem comes when we are talking about the functions because the composition of the protein changes with the function. So what functions the bacteria are performing despite being similar may result in a different set of uh, outputs. So one has to be careful and st as I said this is a new technique. Once all this is done, again it's a matter of statistics but something that one should always do is go for, when you are comparing groups, go for a Venn diagram. This is an old paper though but it very beautifully uh, shows that from the same lab, the same group of people working on four different animal models of liver disease, they have a different composition of the bacteria and the, these numbers, the outer numbers are actually distinct than the rest of the numbers which are very few. And this shows how rapidly the or how dramatically the bacteria respond to different treatments even in animals. So this is also happening in us also and whatever groups we are comparing. So that is why as I said in the very beginning that we should consider analyzing bacteria in different disease conditions. Another uh, fancy diagram is this one which came out very recently where different food groups, nutrients and dietary patterns were analyzed. And uh, uh, this is nothing but the reds show the increase, the blue show the increase and the stars show which one is significant and which one is not significant, which can be very easily uh, you know, uh, t taken from uh, or can be achieved by using statistical methods. Nothing unusual. This one is a recent work the, that uh, uh, approved did. Uh, where uh, FMT was performed, the clinical trial, and I like to bring your focus to this, where we captured the bacteria on day 0, 7, 28, and up till actually 360. But what is important is that FMT is considered to be very beautiful and working all the time. But again, this figure shows at what time was the sample taken will tell you, will give you a result. That does not mean how the FMT is performing. As we see here, that within seven days of FMT, the bacterial load is super high. And yes, everything is back to normal because healthy bacteria was introduced. But till day 28, everything kinds of reduce in number. Now what is interesting is that those who survived till 90, some of them did not survive, but those who survived till 90, the numbers got back up. So kinetics in bacteria is also important and just comparing a static one-to-one -one correlation really gives a picture but not the details of what is happening with the bacteria. Now I come to a, a point, the last section, where machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, has also been included in uh, uh, the bacterial analysis. And what I'm going to show is an example. We are, uh, uh, we are currently uh, performing these kind of analysis, standardizing the techniques and all. But uh, coming to the definition first, as Tom Michel, uh, the professor from Carnegie Mellon who uh, who defined the machine learning for the first time in 1997 said, a computer program is set to learn from experience E with respect to some class of tasks T and performance measure P if its performance at tasks in T as measured by P improves the experience E. Nice. 
even I did not understand it, but spent almost half an hour on this and I found the computer program learns the variability in parameters in relation to the outcome and processes these variations to provide results. When a new set of data with the same parameters is given, so there are two things that need to be understood here. One is that outcome is important. For machine learning processes, outcome should be known. If you do not know what the outcome we are comparing, machine learning is going infinitely. Then the other is that the same set of parameters is to be used. If we change the set of parameters, then whatever machine learning is giving out is a result of that a different set of parameters. So if we are using machine learning, we have to keep the parameters same. We cannot change the parameters. We can have the, the, the comparative groups can be the same. So overall, what I understood was that machine learning is a computational or a mathematical algorithm or a program which uh, analyzes a certain set of data which would otherwise have taken humans a very, very long time. Now, the way we do these analysis is basically regularly what we do is we have the data, we put a formula or put it in a SPSS package or Excel or give it some equation and then and then we get the results and output. But what machine learning is doing is it is using the same set of data using a certain set of formulae. Again, I'll come to what form, what kind of different analysis is done. Take these formulae, give a result and output. What it does next is very interesting. It takes the same output, takes the information from that, puts it back in the formula and keeps it in the memory. That memory is then used for a second iteration with the data and again the outputs and are captured in the memory refined in a refined form and this goes on till the number of iterations that we have defined whether it should run 100 times or it should run 200 times or depending on which kind of uh, strategy we are using. So basically if we ask a human to do this it is going to take a very very long time. So machine learning is nothing but you know, uh, capitalizing on the fact that machines work faster, computers work faster, they take this advantage and perform the same uh, mathematical analysis which can be done on an Excel sheet, except for a certain methods. Now, machine learning is not new. Fisher in 1950s identified t-tests and uh, linear and logistic regressions is probably known for even before that. So, the main types of machine learning that we have is Regression, classification, clustering, dimension reduction, association, and neural networks. This is like the broadest of the classifications. And regression, classification, clustering, and dimension reduction is done four minutes. So this, these, the top four methods are done statistically every day, everywhere. These are still part of machine learning. Does not mean that statistics is wrong and bad, and machine learning is most beautiful. Anyhow, association rule learning, neural networks are the newer technologies. Again, these are mathematical equations, complex mathematical equations. Let's not go into details, but still maths is there and this is nothing that machine is doing automatically. We are not considering here those levels of artificial intelligence where machines are thinking. So the basic classification, uh, this uh, flow diagram actually shows what basic classification of machine learning is. So broadly, if you uh, just uh, remember that there is supervised, unsupervised and reinforced learning. And if you look at uh, the, the sub classifications, the most of these methods mentioned in the in, at the bottom are used in everyday practice by us, most of them, except for neural networks and hidden Markovs and other and Bayesian methods, because uh, generally we do not use them uh, regularly. We use them whenever we are doing some high genome uh, analysis or evolutionary analysis. In fact, Dr. Ekta has also used one of them, a few of them in her papers. So uh, this is uh, this is used very commonly. Now, the catch here is that what is the interpretability of the machine learning model, which is very important. Why it is important? Because machine is going to give you an output after that complex mathematical churning. But what is the interpretability? Can you associate a cause and effect kind of uh, understanding that what caused a certain result to come. Now this actually reduces with the more advanced techniques. So if you look at this graph, logistic regression, decision trees, these here you can identify the cause and say that okay because of this particular factor there is a difference in the two groups. But 
when you go to neural levels and if you look at the figure on the bottom right here there are th this is a network neural network analysis where each circle is a mathematical equation so one mathematical equation gives the data to the next the next one gives to the next and finally something happens inside the computer and the result comes out what is interesting is that here we have this is a a feed forward kind of a setup where only information is going from left to right but here the complex modern methods have a feed backward loop also so the information can go back again learning can happen it can come out so it is very difficult to understand what the result is now with this i uh, come to a quick example if we take this study is a 2014 study by zeller et al and what they have done is they have shown how machine learning and uh, the the regular analysis uh, identifies the results distinctly so here if this is a very classical method where differentially abundant features which is increased and which is decreased between control and colorectal cancers gut microbiota is captured what is the significance what is the fold change some increased some decreased what was the shift whether one type was increasing the other was decreasing and what was the area under the curve this is a very classical simple analysis where we can identify and say okay this bacteria is important this is not important this decreases this increases when you apply machine learning in the same group what what they found is that there is this group of bacteria which is marked in brown which is able to classify mentioned at the bottom based on various factors so if we consider age there is no difference across the groups but when we come to ajcc american uh, joint committee for cancer staging uh, ranking we can very easily see that yes there is a very distinct group but again so what's so great this was colorectal cancer and only cancer samples were classified in grades the others were not so yes but when we look at uh, i i forget what fobt is but then if you look at this there is sparsity in samples in this data and there is a dense cluster here which means that for this particular feature these bacteria are able to differentiate them now if we go on doing this iteratively it would have taken a lot of time another important aspect that we always miss is uh, what is called as last this is the last slide the second last slide so what we call is as a lasso model lasso is a statistical method and it should be used and should be forced to use by anybody doing uh, microbiota analysis because where it it comes into play when we have a large number of parameters in a few number of samples for example we have 1500 taxa 1500 genera or species or whatever and we have only 100 samples so this actually biases collinearity comes collinearity comes into play and all these things happen so this needs to be under taken into consideration and applied whenever such analysis is being taken so the last slide so the questions that we need to ask is what is the control group experimentally very important which site or sample we are using what is the taxonomic level of classification are we happy with phyla or do we really need to go to species or we want to find out the single nucleotide variations and all and what is the end point how long do you want to collect the stool samples because since it's a good representation then what should be the sample size classical statistical questions what is the time frame of for the historical profile that needs to be taken dietary interventions or dietary modifications or dietary profiles then what are the clinical pro, uh, parameters that need to be recorded and most importantly what is the budget which actually is integrated with all these parameters again this becomes a little more complex if you want to apply machine learning thank you there is the ilbs data and the work you do this is supposed to be a class where you explain what how you process what is the stool lab you know i wish you had a structured presentation where at least you have shown what is being done how people are involved what are the lacunae any other comments on this are going on right now sorry i was also keen to know the kind of studies which are going on right now just to i mean you know juxtapose them in the pediatric setting and i'm not sure whether the ad adult co uh, controls can work for pediatric um, age group or not that also is something that's not clear to me 
And finally, like you said, that machine learning, if included in this, would entail a lot more money. So machine learning, what else do we need beyond this for machine learning? I mean, how are we, I'm, I'm not too sure how do, do they go about with the analysis in machine learning. Because it starts with logistic regression and comes down to neural... Uh... Yeah, so the first question, uh, what are the studies that are going on? Uh, we do Details not have, of those, yeah. We do not have the data because we are still processing it. Uh, what uh, we are doing is we are uh, identifying, uh, in one study we are trying to capture uh, what is the variation of, what is the effect of purgation on healthy individuals and what is the change in the gut microbiota and what is the resultant outcome. Uh, in relation to dietary modifications. The other is uh, how the NAFLD uh, microbiota changes in a family. So some individual in a family may be having NAFLD, the others do not have NAFLD. So what is the difference in the microbiota? It is little more complex than that. We do not have time for uh, all the details, but uh, the student would be presenting it very soon. The work is almost finished. We are finalizing the figures and uh, results. Uh, for the machine learning component, uh, each machine learning component is a standalone analysis. Logistic regression is not the start of neural networks. So it depends on the kind of question you want to ask and that question is dependent on what is the endpoint you have. You want a live dead comparison, logistic regression can be good enough, no need for neural network. Again, if you have a lot of parameters which are not known or have not been analyzed earlier, you would like to go for something like neural network or clustering where the the, the the mathematical algorithm automatically segregates the groups and identify which are the parameters which are uh, which are contributing to a particular stage. Well, thank you, Shwetank. Thank you. We are over running the time. Thank you so much. I just have to congratulate Dr. Ankur, who got the Rising Star Award this year from the APSL. It's a great honor. And Ankur is around. I must have gone by now. Congratulations to Ankur. Thank you, Shweta.